screen. So today we'll be talking about the perils of predatory publishing. Um, and I think you've all figured out where the webinar, the go to webinar questions box is. But if you need to ask any questions, I will be keeping an eye on it in the uh, in the course of this webinar. Um, there is a little box at the bottom of your screen. And if you uh, click on the orange arrow, you'll be able to see there's a chat function and you can ask questions there. And as I say, I'll be monitoring that as we go through. Um, so carry on. Um, and there's the question box. There's what it looks like. And you can just type into the question box. And oh, I forgot to make polls. Uh, so I'll just ask and you can answer. Though I know you did. So actually don't bother answering because I've seen the responses in the question box. So great. Okay, so the objectives of this webinar are to discuss the basics of Minot Library Services, if you're unfamiliar with them, um, to describe the history and natures of predatory journals and publishers, and to demonstrate the problems that arise from the use of these journals, um, and to establish how to identify and avoid these journals. We'll also have a brief section at the end that talks about fake news, what it is and how to identify it. Um, and Without further ado, I guess I'll get started. So MyNet is uh, spelled MCNET, but pronounced MyNet. It is Manitoba's Health Information and Knowledge Network, and it's a service provided by the University of Manitoba Libraries to staff of Manitoba Health, seniors in active living, fee-for-service physicians in Manitoba, and staff of participating regional health authorities. Now, as far as we know at the time, we should remain active while this whole quarantine situation is going on, uh, much of what we do is digital, or much of what MyNet does. I guess I'm not with the unit anymore. Um, but there is potential that that chain will change, so keep the uh, keep an eye out. Uh, the same with the unit that I'm part of, the virtual library. I don't see why we shouldn't be able to continue to function as, well, relatively normal, though, of course, you're all in my apartment right now. <laughs> so... Um, I can just add the only thing so far that uh, is has interrupted our service is loaning books. Um, so it's been increasingly harder and harder to get books from other libraries, even within the University of Manitoba libraries. And even once we have those books, it's really hard to get them into healthcare facilities, understandably so. And so mm -hmm. aren't actually loaning um, any books right now, nor accepting them. Um, but other than that, we tend not to loan a lot of physical books to MyNet clients anyway. Yeah, so, so we're here for you in this time when you might really need some health resources. Um, so the MyNet team is Orvi Dingwall and Christine Nielsen, both of whom are on this chat here, uh, who introduced me today. Um, there's also Gail Matheson and Cheryl Haas. And then, of course, there's me, the virtual library liaison, who's formerly of MyNet. Um, and so MyNet library cards are free. You can complete the borrow registration form at the link here. Uh, we'll be sending out the slides uh, either later today or tomorrow. Um, so follow up. Um, the services provided are literature searches, document delivery, though, as we've noted, that is somewhat limited, uh, no physical items. Um, at the moment, uh, current awareness alerts and education and orientation se uh, sessions. Um, so I'll just ask, and you can answer in the chat, uh, have you heard of predatory journals or predatory publishers before? I'll give you a, a moment or two to think about that. All right, we've got an answer. Um, yes, okay, so it sounds like people have heard about them. Good. Uh, I will still go through uh, what they are as part of this, but you already have some sense, so that's great. Um, so in terms of what predatory publishers and journals are, there was recently a meeting of a whole bunch of people who are experts in the area of predatory uh, publishers, predatory journals. Um, and this is an area that is relatively new, though the term has been around for a while, actual real studies about it, actual real um, research-based information is 
really within the last two or three years has started to come out. So you may have actually seen this article. It was in uh, Nature, and they talk about the need to define what predatory journals are in order that they can be studied, in order that the extent of their reach and the nature of the problem can be discussed more clearly. And the definition that they came up with was predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. Now, there are a few things that you might be surprised aren't in here. They don't talk about, for example, peer review, and I'll be talking about peer review in the course of this, uh, in the course of the seminar today. But I, the key, and that's mostly because it's really hard to determine whether or not really somebody has done a peer review or, or if that peer review is good, because of course the practice is relatively secretive in most disciplines. You don't, uh, unless the journal is practicing open peer review when you get, where you get to see what people have written on a manuscript, you don't actually know for sure that peer review has occurred. And so that can't be part of the definition because you can't figure that out easily um, at this point in time anyways. So the key thing, the key most important part of this definition, I would say, is that they prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship. That is, profits are the only thing that matter to them. Now, many of the large publishers that we're familiar with today also prioritize uh, profit, but they don't do it at the expense of scholarship. They're still producing a good product. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about what what exactly predatory publishers look like, predatory journals look like when you see them. Um, but we'll talk about the history first. Uh, so traditional academic publishing, so the journals that are the main ones that have been around for many years, there's a subscription model. So what happens is you publish in the journal, it's free for you to publish in the journal, and then the library or an organization purchases a, or a person purchases a subscription to it and they're able to read what's in there. And so that's how traditional publishers make their money from the subscription fees that libraries and individuals and others are paying. Um, in Now recently there's been a push towards open access. Now open access is great because it allows people to access information freely from all over the world. You don't have to put things behind paywalls. The information is available. And we've seen, especially with this COVID-19 outbreak, how important it is to have the information at your fingertips. And lots of publishers you may have seen are dropping their paywalls so that information that would be difficult to access before is now available uh, to everybody if they need to see it because it's so important to make sure that that information is there. And so open access strives to do that. The downside of open access, of course, is that the traditional model for publishers making money doesn't work. You can't subscribe to, you can't charge a subscription fee to something that's available to everybody. So in general, the model for every type of uh, open access, except something called platinum open access, in which nobody pays anything at all, is that the author pays. So there's something called an author processing charge in which you submit to a journal, you pay the journal, the journal publishes it. This, of course, is very easy to take advantage of. Um, you can very easily see how somebody would be like, oh, well, that's just great. We'll take the money from people and we'll set up a website. And that's fantastic. It's just like a, it looks just like an academic journal. So we'll have academic people submitting to us, great. And so in 2010, a librarian named Jeffrey Beale coined the term predatory publishing to describe these publishers that are doing something that looks like academic publishing but isn't in order to make a quick buck. Now, there's been contention over the use of the term predatory publishing. Other terms have been put forward, deceptive publishing, bad faith publishers, that sort of thing. But predatory publishing is the term that everybody knows which is why the Nature article and the consensus unit stuck with it. Everybody knows what it's talking about in terms of this is what people are familiar with 
in order to talk about it in a different way, you'd have to spend a lot of time rebranding it so that people knew what you were talking about. Um, but be aware that the term is contentious. Some people don't like it because it's not always a predatory situation. Some people are using predatory publishers with full knowledge of what they are. Um, so that's that. Uh, so here's the bit where I talk about the nature of predatory journals and peer review. Even though peer review didn't make it into that formal definition, there is still an understanding that predatory journals don't really do peer review or they don't do an extensive peer review or in some cases because they are just outsourcing the peer review to other people you know send it out ask for feedback from experts and they give feedback but there's some evidence that people can just they'll do the peer review and then the author who has the peer who gets the peer review will be like well I don't want to do that and the journal's like sure and then they'll publish it as is without any of the changes. Um, so that's that's the state of peer review. Of course, peer review is the process by which a manuscript is sent to experts in the field to solicit feedback. Um, and many predatory journals on their website, they'll advertise, they'll do a rapid peer review process. And you know, you'll have acceptance of your acceptance and publication of your paper within a week. Um, which is for anybody who has published in really any academic circles, that's absurdly fast. Um, it, it represents, generally speaking, a, a lack of rigor. Now, in some situations, I imagine, for instance, right now with the COVID-19 situation, that peer review is occurring faster and publication is occurring faster than it usually would. Um, but Generally speaking, I mean, I've waited two years uh, to publish in a journal before, so a week is, is unrealistic in most situations. But again, peer review isn't something that you can look at, so it's a challenge. Um, so then there's the other question, the quality of the articles. Now, I want to begin by saying that many of the people who publish in predatory journals are doing so unknowingly. And the work that they submit is quality work. And so there may be good work that is published in predatory journals, um, which unfortunately hasn't had the benefit of genuine feedback from experts or, or anything like that. But there is definitely indications that the quality of articles is not necessarily good and that the quality required for publication there is no required level of quality for publication. So for example, there have been a number of sting operations where people have submitted a clearly bad paper to predatory journals to see what happens, right? So if there have been different levels of poor quality, there's one that that was just an entire paper filled with the words, get me off your fucking mailing list over and over and over again. And that got accepted, which is ridiculous. But then there are other ones that they look like real papers, but if any expert looked at them, they'd be like, well, this doesn't adhere to any sort of scientific methodology or this doesn't make any sense. Um, there was one that was written by uh, like the autocomplete text. So, uh, one of the big ones was the Bohannon sting. Uh, in this sting operation, 304 poor quality articles were submitted to open access journals and over half of them were accepted in these journals. Um, this led to meaningful change in the directory of open access journals. Uh, they looked at what standards they were using to list open access journals in their publications and said, okay, this isn't rigorous enough and they made a change as a result of this sting operation. Um, but as I say, most of the articles submitted to these journals aren't deliberately bad. And in fact, some of them are probably quite good. Um, but it does suggest that you can publish anything you want, anything at all. Uh, and that is a problem. Um, I should add one more note. There have been criticisms of these sting operations as being dis disingenuous and dishonest and not really reflecting the problem precisely because most articles that are going off to these journals aren't deliberately bad. 
Um, I think it still serves the point personally, but I also understand the arguments that these operations were done in bad faith. Uh, so something to consider as you think about predatory journals. So what is in uh, predatory journals in general? If you're if you're looking at all of them, I have said that there is potential for there to be perfectly fine articles in them. Um, so there have been some studies. One of them looked at the content of predatory nursing journals. Uh, many of them looked like genuine articles at a glance, but reading them closer revealed flawed research design. Um, studies of poor average quality and almost half of them had plagiarized content included in them. Um, another study of a similar nature suggested that a lot of the articles in public predatory journals uh, typically display bad writing uh, or sorry bad reporting bad methods or both um, and you can see I've got the citations there at the bottom uh, Owerman and, and Mower are the two uh, Mower is one of the really big names in uh, in studying predatory journals. If you're wanting to see more, he's part of an initiative out of, I think it's the University of Ottawa actually, that is building a task force or has built a task force to study predatory journals in more detail. So uh, something to check out if you want some further reading. Um, one of the things about these studies, though, is that they often look only at predatory journals, and they're they're not doing a side by side comparison with legitimate nursing journals. So, perhaps if we looked at legitimate nursing journals, we would see that just as many of them had flawed research design. But I hope not. <laughs> um, there's also a subspecies of predatory journals known as hijacked journals. Um, and these are journals that are designed to look like other journals that exist or, or to design to use logos that look like uh, the logos of reputable publishers or reputable journals. Um, so there's here's an example of a list. You can see there's a JNCC report, which is a hijacked journal pretending to be the JNCC report series or um, ones that even have the exact same name and some of them uh, like the okay I don't speak German but there's the National Park Forschung in Dirge anyways the the black words in the authentic column there um, they're black because there is no website for that journal but if you look at the journal on the other side there is a website and there are certain journals that have never developed websites that still that still use mail and manuscript uh, submission techniques and uh, predatory journals have been able to take advantage of that by by setting up a website and having people assume that they're submitting to this legitimate journal that they know of when in fact they're not um, and so you'll you'll get a sense they still if you look at the website it looks like a journal website um, you can see here I've got the Arctic journal uh, there's the authentic journal on the right there and the hijack journal on the left. Um, they both look like they could be journals about the Arctic. The picture of in on the hijack journal, you'll even see that they list an ISSN and they'll list all this information about the journal. And that is the information about the actual journal. It's just that that website isn't the website for the actual journal. So if you submitted your journal here, instead of at the authentic journal, the, the one through the University of Calgary, you'd end up paying money and thinking that your work was was going to be presented in the actual Arctic journal, um, and it isn't. Um, but what's published in it? Uh, well, the authentic journal publishes Arctic studies. The hijack journal publishes work about anything, um, any topic it wants, and so one of the ones that came up when I looked at it was the effect of nutrient concentrate in ration to performance of local chickens, which sounds very Arctic to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you can get a sense of that. Um, there's also recently been a surge in predatory conferences. This is an issue. They'll claim that these fancy keynotes and great speakers and they'll have them in these locations uh that are you know vacation spots 
and they'll charge exorbitant fees and they'll also often host several conferences in one hotel at the same time and when people show up ready to present their information they'll realize it's it's just a puppet theater basically they'll show up none of the keynotes that they were there to listen to will be there and in fact if they contact the keynotes keynotes will never have even heard of this place or this conference and certainly never agreed to speak at it um so do keep an eye out for those uh, especially since there are a lot of small conferences so that how you hear about them is from an email that you receive The other thing about the uh, predatory journals is that they like to spam you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I get a whole bunch of solicitations from predatory journals every day. And I've saved a bunch of them. So like, you can get a sense. Dear M. Maureen, that is, Maureen is not my last name. M is my initial, my last name is bad. Um, you know, it typically starts with something like this, warm greetings. Journal of Nursing Sciences inviting editorial board members. We are aware of your reputation for quality research and trustworthiness in the field through your publications. Now, while I have published in nursing journals, I do not have a reputation in the field. I do not have a reputation for high quality research that a nursing journal should be approaching me to be on their editorial board. I am a librarian. <laughs> um, so this is, of course, ridiculous. Um, and, and you get tons of them. Honorable Dr. Maureen Babb, I'm not a doctor. Uh, dear Dr. Maureen Babb, greetings of the day. Dear M. Maureen, or Dr. M. Maureen, sorry. Dear Dr. Maureen Babb, dear Babb M. Dear Dr. Maureen Babb, and so on. And it just goes on. Oops, okay, I thought I had more spam in this image, but you know, you get tons of it and it's annoying. Um, and a lot of them will tell you this sort of weird information, like look at this, this great scientific journal impact factor, this index Copernicus value. Now these are meant to tell you that their journal's so good and that it's, it's got a high ranking. These are made up numbers. Um, the journal citation reports puts out the journal impact factor, the real or the impact factor uh, for journals. That is the only place where that comes from. There is, I mean, there is, I guess now a company that's made up an index Copernicus value, but it's just made up numbers, made up values. Um, and they're meant to try and prove to you that these are quality publications, but they're not, it's all, it's all made up. Um, uh, on a related note, uh, journal impact factor has a place, but it's, it's not really meant to be used as a way to assess which, journals you yourself are publishing in or even which journals are best. It was more developed to help make purchasing decisions easier for librarians. Um, so do think about that when you are considering where to publish as well. Um, but also be aware that definitely if they're referring to the index Copernicus value, that's made up and it's fake and you shouldn't give it any consideration at all. Um, so the question is, who publishes in predatory journals? Now, as I've mentioned, a lot of the people, most of the people, I would suspect, are people who have been tricked, who just don't really know what they're publishing in, who think this is a reasonable journal or think this is the journal they've heard of and have published in it anyways. Uh, there are also those who publish in these journals knowingly, maybe for speed, maybe to game the system, maybe because they know their work won't be accepted by an authentic journal, maybe those who have political or financial motivations, those who don't see the problem, maybe those who are, you know, they're going up for tenure or promotion like next year and they just need that one more publication and they'll toss it in, nobody will notice. So, but I would say that the vast majority of them are people who have been tricked. And I've actually been doing a study on predatory journals myself. And I believe more now that most people who publish in the journals are people who have been tricked than I did when I started the study, um, just because of the evidence that I personally have found as well. Um, the other thing is, this is a worldwide problem, uh, predatory journals are. For a long time, there was sort of a discussion that, oh, it really only happens in the global south with less developed nations, um, but recent studies have shown that, no, in fact, it's worldwide, it's at all sorts of institutions, it's people who are brand new researchers and people who are really experienced researchers, 
people who work at small local colleges and people who work at fancy Ivy League institutions like Harvard University. Um, so it is a large scale problem. Um, so why are predatory journals a problem? I've, I've spent some time talking about what it is. Now, hopefully the fact that they prioritize profit over everything else has given you some hint of why. Um, but I mean, some people are like, well, if you want to throw your money at that, fine. Or, or if you want, you know, hopefully the scholars who are reading this work recognize when a journal article is a piece of garbage, right? Like, what's the problem? What does it matter? Well, it does pollute the literature. It makes it harder to find actual quality studies of what you're looking for. Um, it allows scholars to, if people aren't paying attention and somebody's somebody's publishing in these journals knowingly to make themselves look like a better scholar than they are, um, then those people have the ability to move upwards in the rank or in the field without really actually having done the work. Um, there's damage to the reputations of those that publish in these journals uh, if they're found out and, excuse me, potentially even those that cite them. Uh, there's also a lack of permanence um, many of the websites are there and gone in a flash. So if you've submitted your paper to it and it's gone up and then a year later that website doesn't exist, your paper doesn't exist and probably you can't resubmit it because you've submitted it and published it somewhere else before. Um, but it's also, uh, do I have this on the next slide? So one of the things that I, I forgot to write down on the slide, but it is that it isn't always scholars who have the wherewithal to understand what they're reading looking at the literature. Um, members of the general public can look at it, especially because they're open access and findable on, on Google and that sort of thing. So, you know, you've got all these articles that look like real articles. There was a, uh, one of the, the authors in of the nature study that gave the definition talked about how uh, somebody he knew had gone to a, a uh, like a, a naturopathic doctor and they'd had this article that they'd pulled off saying that some treatment, like some uh, made up sort of treatment actually worked, but it didn't. And it was able to be published and it, it looks like a standard journal. So why wouldn't you believe that, right? Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, in terms of polluting the literature, uh, there are certain areas where that's really important. So uh, of course you guys are health professionals and I'm going to be talking about fish here for a minute, but there's this case from uh, fresh, freshwater ichthyology, so freshwater fish studies in India. Um, and for each journal or for each article published in about about freshwater ecology in India, if it's in a predatory journal, it averages about 2.25 citations per paper. Um, so they, they are getting read, they are getting cited. And in some fields, the number of predatory journals is comparable to the number of legitimate journals. Um, but the freshwater ecology case is in India, in ichthology, it's very important or, or you get a lot of credit, like a lot of cred if you name a new species, if you find a new species or if you find a new species that's in some location where you didn't expect it to be, right? And so you publish that and you name your fish and you're like, wonderful. And then it's out there in the literature. And then somebody else coming along is like, oh man, I didn't know that fish made it all the way up this river. And, and then it creates a picture that isn't actually true. And while you might be able to, in some cases, verify that or not based on their methodology, really, can you look at it and say, well, no, that fish isn't in that lake. Like, you don't, you don't know unless you're doing that study yourself. And even if you are, maybe you just didn't see that fish and it really is there. So, um, and there are cases in this freshwater theology where the same fish has been named by four different people and they've all gotten the credit for it, but it's the same fish. And so then, you have to backtrack and say, okay, well, who named it first and, and do all this fixing up of what's messed up. And then if, if for whatever reason, the second name became the popular name, other people have to, you know, that's what they'll be citing, but then it turns out that it's the other fish. Anyways, 
it's a problem. It can pollute the literature, it can cause problems, and it does. In, as, as this uh, report of a study of freshwater ecology in India demonstrates. Um, and then the other thing is, like, if you're only looking at a citation list, like if you saw this list of articles, could you tell which one was published in a predatory journal? I mean, I couldn't. Um, anybody who wants to guess is welcome to guess in the comments. Um, but that one was published in the predatory journal. I, I mean, I wouldn't have known. The one thing that might have suggested it, it said it's a single author for a medical study, which is kind of weird, but I wouldn't default assume that that's a credit was published in a predatory journal. And what about if you saw it in, in a context uh, like this, like Google Scholar? You're on the Google Scholar page and you're looking up stuff about blood groups. Okay, well, there it is among all these other studies. It just looks like anything else. Um, so you're quite likely to find this sort of stuff. Um, it does do damage. It does. It, it's detrimental to the reputation of researchers and to institutions. Um, if you submit something to a predatory journal, realize it's a predatory journal and they're like, oh God, oh no, I don't want that there. They charge fees for withdrawals and often they still won't withdraw it anyway. Um, there's the difficulty of removing items from journals. Um, even if you never did agree to publish, if you never sign the final document, they'll often have it up there. And then once it's up there on the website in this, in this other predatory journal, you can't send it anywhere else because it's already published. Uh, so that impacts you as, as a, a researcher. Um, there's also, and I talked about this before, there's a lack of permanent storage and a potential loss of scholarly information if they're submitted to these journals. There's no, uh, the findability is limited, which is both a blessing and a curse because if the findability of predatory journals is low, that's good in some ways, but it also means that if there's a decent study in there, it's not going to be seen by other people because it's so hard to find. And most importantly, I would say, is that it undermines the credibility of scholarship. It, it makes it look like you can just publish anything and that's a scholarly study. And that's great, um, even though there's no rigor and no scholarly standards. And again, you know, to those people who are familiar with the field, great, you'll probably recognize if it's garbage, but the general public won't, or even somebody from a different field who needs to look at your field uh, for some reason, some study that they're working on, they won't necessarily know that. Um, there's also political and financial motivations. Now, this is an area that hasn't been studied very much, but there's some indication, for instance, that pharmaceutical companies have published some of their uh, results in predatory journals in order to get things pushed through faster so they can start making money. Um, now, in some cases, when they've been, I guess, audited is the word, but when they've looked at it, they've been like, okay, well, these studies are actually well done. Um, and it really was just about speed. But that's not necessarily going to be the case every time, right? Certainly, you could say, well, it turns out that you know there are some ethical issues with this drug, and we probably shouldn't be pushing it forward, but we've already dumped a bunch of money into it. Let's publish it anyways and not talk about those ethical issues, and maybe that would get caught in a real, real peer review, but it wouldn't get caught in a predatory journal peer review. And then it'll be there, and then you can take that to your uh, to uh, the organization that facilitates the use of drugs in your country and say, look at this, it's great. And they'll take a look at it and they'll be like, yep, that's great. We approve this drug for general use in the public, even though if it had been a real study uh, done properly, that might have indicated that the drug wasn't safe. So. so what's the reach? I talked about how some of them are not findable. Um, so really, how much damage are they doing? And, and the vast majority of them probably, even if they are bad studies, aren't doing very much damage. They're hard to find. Uh, studies have suggested that some of them, many of them, don't get cited all that much. Um, but again, neither do most studies in general. Um, 
So the real answer is what to what is the reach of predator of articles in predatory journals is the reach is as far as you as an author are willing to let it go. Um, so another one of these sting operations, I think it was John Bohannon, Bohannon again as well for this one, wrote an article about how eating chocolate accelerates weight loss. You might even remember seeing stories about this in the news when it happened, I certainly do. Um, but not only did they publish in the predatory journal, they set up a press release and they sent it out to a whole bunch of uh, news media organizations. And you know, it had some, some sexy keywords like chocolate and weight loss. Um, and the media just picked it up like that. Um, and they were contacted by very few people uh, in the media about this study for clarification on details. In fact, I don't think anybody clarified details of the study. They just talked about, uh, you know, is this how you spell your name if they called them or something like that. Um, so that's, it can go pretty far. Um, it got into a number of different journals and major news sites. So uh, something to consider. So how common are predatory journals? Um, they are more common in some fields than others. Uh, sciences and medicine and health uh, tend to be very popular areas um, in which predatory journals exist. The social sciences and the humanities, not so much. It's probably a function of uh, medicine and health and sciences receive actual funding and the humanities and the social sciences don't receive funding nearly as much and not so much to representation of any sort of morality or instinct within the field. Um, so uh, different suggestions. Um, in some areas of health fields, there are as many as um, uh, yeah, so so uh, 22 for your guys purposes, studies have shown that about 22 percent of the predatory journals out there are in health related fields. Um, in some areas, some studies have suggested that many of the new case, uh, case study journals are new journals. And then there are some fields like neurology uh, where it seems like about half of the journals out there might be predatory journals. And it's, it's very difficult to figure out this sort of information, um, which is why the numbers are so fuzzy here. Um, but in some fields, it might be the case that even though there are quite a few journals, uh, predatory journals, there are so many more journals that they're representing only about 2% of the journals in that field or 0.5% or of the journals in that field. And as I say, it's very difficult to figure that out, especially because the studies are still happening. It's, it's still a very new field. Real, genuine study of, of predatory journals didn't really begin until 2017, um, even though they'd been talked about and argued about and People heard a heck of a lot about them in libraries. We're doing all sorts of webinars and in-person sessions like what I'm doing here, talking about it. Really, 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 they haven't been studied very much yet at all um, within the last three years. So hold on, you'll hear more about it soon. <laughs> so for, from your perspective, how do you avoid predatory journals? Um, I, I assume that's probably what you're wondering about. How do you avoid publishing in them? How do you avoid using them in your research? Um, there are different strategies. There's lists of predatory journals. There's lists of approved journals, uh, sometimes called blacklists and whitelists. Um, there's checklists. There's critical assessment of uh, information, which is something you should always be doing. But most importantly, always read the full text. And if you're saying, man, I don't know about the, this study seems like it was poor quality. Yeah, it probably was. Um, and use your judgment as, as a researcher um, in that regard and, and trust your spider sense. Um, just, because, just because something looks legitimate doesn't mean it is. You don't have to use it. <laughs> so there, there have been lists of predatory journals in the past. There was Beale's List. He's the librarian who named it. This is no longer being maintained, though there are uh, mirrored resources and an anonymous mirroring of it um, that is still being updated, but the, 
it's not reliable. There's also uh, Cables has a blacklist of uh, predatory journals. It's subscription only. Um, I've never used it. The U of M doesn't subscribe to it. Uh, there are lists of approved journals. Um, the Directory of Open Access Journals is one of those. And while studies indicate there are still a few predatory journals in there, it's, it's not the same as it was before that Bohannon sting and the upping of their measures to what's being used. Um, I heard a ping, but I don't see a question. So I'm going to assume that there isn't one. Um, there's uh, also a cables whitelist of approved journals. Um, and then there are curated databases like Medline. Um, and while there is potential for predatory journals to sneak into some, uh, they tend to be, they tend to contain mostly legitimate journals. Um, there's been some concern with PubMed recently that uh, predatory journals can sneak in through sort of a back door. Um, hopefully, they'll be cracking down on that. But, um, but there is a problem with these lists. First of all, uh, for a lot of them, there's a lack of transparency. You're not clear what uh, what standards they're using to determine whether a, a journal is predatory or not. Um, there's changing situations of publishers. There are some publishers that, when they began, behaved very much like predatory journals or, or predatory publishers, but then got their act together, cleaned it up, and now produce reputable scholarly journals and information. Um, there are also situations where a formerly reputable journal has been sold or has changed its editorial practices and has gone from being something that is legitimate to something that is a piece of garbage. Um, but they might still be on a list saying, oh no, this one's real good. Um, there's the cost of maintenance associated with the list. So you, uh, Cabell's is, their lists are subscription only, and that's so that they can maintain the resources they need to maintain the list. Um, there's also potential for misclassification. There, you know, you can do these assessments, but you might still put a bad journal on a good list or a good journal on a bad list. Um, basically, the problem with lists is that they are providing a simple answer for a very complex problem. Uh, predatory journals, the way to think of them is not as this journal is predatory or this journal is not, but to think of it as a sliding scale of predatory traits to legitimate traits. And many journals will fall somewhere along that line. And part of your job as a researcher is to determine at what point does it fall too far along the predatory scale for comfort. Um, and often this is a judgment call. There are, there are journals that are very clearly predatory journals. Um, there was uh, recently, there's a publisher known as Omix, um, and they were one of the big ones that Beale always fought with, and, and they sued Beale and all this sort of thing. But the Federal Trade Commission in the United States uh, recently charged them with fraud. And that case has concluded, and they have been charged with fraud to the tune of something like $50 million. Um, they're based in India, so they won't pay it because the company is in the United States and they continue to proclaim their innocence. But I mean, that's that's a fairly clear cut scenario, but they aren't all like that. So what about PubMed? I did mention that there are back doors to get journals into PubMed. Um, most of the journals in PubMed are legitimate. It does have a higher rate of predatory journals or predatory seeming journals in it than some of the other databases like Medline, for example. Um, another tool is checklists. Uh, so I've got some links here. Again, I'll be sending out the slides or, or we'll be sending out the slides. Um, these uh, are tools that you can use to look through and say, okay, well, these are common traits associated with predatory journals, um, keep track of what's there. So the one from Saskatchewan, if you take a look at it, there's there's three columns that could only fit. What? Okay, 
uh, two on one page and one on the next, but it's good, fair, and poor. And so they talk about all different sorts of things, journal evaluation, uh, publisher evaluation. Um, and so, you know, some of these, you know, any one of these alone is not enough to condemn a, a journal as, uh, as predatory, right? So for example, you've got their uh, journal index and in the good column, you've got the journal is indexed in more than one subject database. So Eric, Google Scholar, well, they shouldn't list Google Scholar on there, um, but web, because Google Scholar is, is, is not an index, it just, um, it's a web crawler, it just pulls things that it thinks look scholarly. Um, but like PsychInfo, Medline, uh, any of the ones that are actually curated, uh, which Google Scholar is not. Um, but then you see in the, the poor quality, uh, the journal is not indexed in a subject database. Okay, well, that might mean that it's a predatory journal, but it might also mean that it's just new. Um, so things to consider, uh, use your best judgment. There are certain things where you could have five of the, the categories from the four column, but you could still make the judgment that this is a just fine journal. Um, so it does take more work to do this. Um, I do think that one of the best mechanisms that doesn't get talked about a lot for determining whether or not something is a predatory journal is your personal familiarity with that journal. Um, if you're active in a field of study, presumably you are familiar with some of the, with many of the major journals, um, with where the literature is published and that sort of thing. Um, so if you're if you're unsure about a journal, think about the journals that you know in that field. And if it's not one of them and you're not sure, maybe just publish somewhere else. Um, there are some key points to watch out for. Uh, very low author fees are one of them, but this depends, of course, on discipline. For example, in librarianship, a lot of the, the open access journals tend to be what we call platinum open access and they don't charge authors fees either. Um, and so, I mean, those are very low author fees, uh, but it doesn't mean that journals are, are predatory. It's just that librarianship as a field tends to have a commitment towards open access uh, that other disciplines might not. And so they want to make sure that you can publish without being charged out the nose for it. Um, if there are spelling and grammar errors or distorted images on the journal site, that might be a sign of a predatory journal. It might just be a sign of a poor website design. I've definitely seen very legitimate, very well-respected journals with garbage websites. Um, but, you know, it might send up a little flag and you should explore further at that point. Um, I would say that lately, uh, as predatory journals are becoming more established and they've they've got more of a sense of what they're doing, that this tends to be less true than it was. Um, in lots of cases, they've hired somebody who knows how to design a website. Um, if they have an overly broad journal scope, um, this is a big one. For instance, that Journal of Arctic Studies we were looking at before, the actual Journal of Arctic Studies publishes articles about the Arctic the fake one publishes anything about science or social science or like they had a blurb in their write up that basically says anything you want to submit, that's fine. Um, if they have language that targets the authors on the journal page rather than the readers, um, ideally a scholarly journal will be interested in what it produces, the scholarship it produces and the quality of that. If it's if you get there and it's like, oh, you should submit immediately, you know, best rates for authors, quick turnaround, um, and that sort of thing, and you're not on specifically an author page, that is a huge red flag. And in fact, I would say that that is one of the best red flags for identifying predatory journals. Um, again, prob promises of rapid publication is another one. And uh, lack of information on things like retraction policies, manuscript handling, and data preservation. But that again is one of those things that could indicate a, a small, poorly staffed journal rather than, or, or volunteer staffed journal rather than 
an actual predatory setup. Um, the other things, communication practices, uh, website competently designed, I sort of talked about how that's becoming less and less a marker. Um, sending out mass emails asking for submissions, all the spam emails that I told you about, or sending out mass emails asking for links, uh, the stability of the publisher, uh, does the journal focus on a coherent discipline? Um, again, the spelling errors, or more importantly, the ludicrous missions of the journal. Um, what is the launch date of the journal? Uh, are there actual previous issues of the journal, or are they, if, and if they say there are previous issues of the journal, if you try and access them, can you? Um, I've found in many of the predatory journals, if you go and look at them, they'll be like, oh, we've been publishing since 1995, but if you look at anything beyond the last two years, it just doesn't exist. Um, are the journals themselves empty shells? Have they only published one or two articles and that sort of thing. Um, the journal team members, is an editorial board listed? And if an editorial board is listed, have the people, do the people on it, are they actually on it? Like if you contacted them or if you looked at their CV, would they be listing this journal on it? Or have they just used the names of some famous or semi-famous scholars? Um, and then what is their business author, business model? Do they have financial support other than author fees? Uh, do they have advertising? And if so, is that advertising reputable? Um, and does the publisher run reputable conferences? Is the publisher associated with um, maybe some sort of academic organization or anything like that? So these are all things to watch out for. Again, no one thing is going to say, yes, this is a predatory journal or no, this isn't. Uh, you have to look at a variety of things you have to make you have to make a judgment call at a certain point and if you're having difficulty making that judgment call whether or not one is predatory or not then maybe the question is if you aren't sure is it worth the risk to publish in it or is it worth the risk to use the article um for using the articles in your research i mean the key things are to make sure that you actually read the article and you practice critical assessment so that's the point of this slide, which is your best bet is the crap test, which is a form of very quick, quick and dirty critical assessment. Um, you want to check out the currency, the reliability, the authority, and the purpose or point of view of the, uh, the article in question. Um, so at this point, does anybody have any questions before I move on to the next area? Because that's all I'm going to be saying about predatory journals. Um, and then I'll be talking about fake news. So I'll give you a few minutes or a few, a little bit to think about any questions. I'm just going to check the time because I can't actually see it right now. Um, oh man, okay, we are almost out of time. I am not going to wait for questions. I am just going to go through, like steamroll through the next bit. Uh, sorry about that. I'm used to being able to see the clock. Okay, so fake news, what is it? Uh, a good definition that I heard in an ACRL, uh, Association of College and Research Libraries webinar is, a, is that it is news that contains clearly and demonstrably false information. Um, so what's the problem with the term fake news? Well, maybe you've already figured that out. It's that it is being used in a political way to deride legitimate news organizations at the moment. Um, I've continued, I've kept it here uh, because I don't have a better term for it at the moment. Um, but be aware that just because somebody is throwing around the term fake news, that doesn't mean they're actually talking about fake news. In this case, I am talking about news that contains clearly and demonstrably false information. Um, so it's a term appropriate. Well, remains to be seen, I suppose. What is it not? Fake news is not satire. It is not news that has political or a certain political slant. And it is also not news that just says things you don't like that happen to be true. Um, this is a, an article from The Onion. Uh, doctors discover that the purpose of the appendix is to contain the human soul. That is satire. I love it. Um, you've got real versus fake news. Uh, fake news sites often try and look like real news sites. And like the predatory journal websites, they're often there and gone. Um, so you've got real ABC News. And then you've got fake abcnews.com. 
uh, CO. Um, so it looks as much like the new site as you can get, but it's it's not giving you real stories. Um, there are countermeasures. There's something called Zimdar's list. There's Snopes, which is a definitive fact-checking site. Uh, there's Wikipedia. It's got a list of fake news sites. You'll see if you look at it how many of them no longer exist. Um, but again, same thing, verify the source, do the craft test. A quick note about COVID-19 and the news. Right now, it is a quick moving situation, as I'm sure you've heard over and over again. There's misinformation and disinformation going out at all these times. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stories that are making it into the news, but right now, the news might not be the best place to go for stories like that, consider looking at the actual health resources to verify any information. Uh, so like the Public Health Agency of Canada or the CDC or anything like that. Um, at the very least right now, I'd suggest double checking news stories, especially about the, the sort of more scientific aspects of the COVID-19 discussion. Um, so that is it. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, well, you can email Orvi or you can uh, email me about specifics related to this talk. There's also the general MyNet services. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's answering the phones right now. I took my phone off because uh, I know nobody is because I am at home without my business phone. So. Um, so that is it from me. I'll exit out of this. Um, forget that assessment survey thing. I forgot that slide was there. It is from an old one. Um, Anything from Christine or or Orvi or I'm not even sure who's still. Here. I just wanted to thank you, Maureen, for your presentation. Um, you've definitely given us a lot to think about. That's for sure. Um, I guess it's a it's a tricky situation. Like there's no clean and cut answer as to be like yes, clearly this is bad and this is good. Um, I know I'm just going to, I'm just going to talk while people think of questions. <laughs> um, not too long ago, I did a literature search for somebody and it was, um, around diets, right? And I'm, and there's, there's all kinds of mm, questionable yeah. stuff about diets. Yeah. <laughs> um, and something that was really interesting. And, and again, I can't say if this was a predatory journal or not for sure. Uh, in the results, I happened to notice that this one particular journal had all of the really glowing positive things to say about this diet. Um, and I looked at the at the website, and it was like, well, this is this is kind of weird. Um, and and it was it was like you said, like there were certain things that should have been there that weren't there. And it was it was the publisher site, not. The, journal site um, and it had like 12 different you know titles but no real no real substance in terms of information um, so I wonder if you if you have any I don't know any kind of final thoughts or um, anything if you if people happen to run across things like that well when you run across in in your studies and you're considering using something in your study um, I mean, my best advice is to read the article and see what you think about the article. Um, because as I say, there are definitely studies that are reasonable quality that have been put into predatory journals because the authors don't know better. Um, they've submitted anyways. And if you notice that it's from a predatory journal, that's a judgment call. There are some uh, journals that when you submit, uh, they specifically say you're not allowed to in include those resources or you maybe need to make a note that those resources are predatory journals or not. Um, but I, when you're doing your own research, I, I think that, you know, and, and you're not sure about a source that you're using, I think that your best bet is to read it and make the call as you're writing the paper. And you can always uh, note concerns about studies in the paper itself. Um, I certainly have run across papers in, <laughs> I actually ran across a paper about predatory, in a predatory <laughs> journal, <laughs> um, which was something else. And it's one of those ones where, where I'm debating, well, when I'm writing up my paper, should I be including that in there? I don't know. 
Um, well, it doesn't look like we're getting any questions. I don't think so. Um, so I guess maybe we'll just say thanks, folks, for tuning in. Um, like Maureen said, slides are coming. Uh, we've also been recording, so um, there'll be a uh, recording will go up. You can check out my apartment at any point. <laughs> there you go. Impressive right. library behind you. Thank you. It is at least fifty percent comic books. <laughs> there you go. All right. So uh, yeah, anything you'd like to add, Orby? No, just thanks for everybody who attended. And a special thanks to Maureen for coming and being our guest presenter. And stay tuned for next, actually May 1st, when we are scheduled to explore the new PubMed. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody.